Hello, everybody. Um, first of all, apologies. We are running a few minutes late here. Um, I'm afraid the technology got the better of us here. And um, Rishad Salamat, who hopefully will still be moderating, um, has had some issues on his end connecting with us. So we'll start and, and hopefully he'll be able to join us. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the first of, of three webinars that we're planning, hosted by 365 Aviation. Uh, we're going to discuss obviously the COVID-19 situation, the impact it's having on us right now from a work perspective, um, and also try to think about what the new working environment might look like when we eventually get back to work and, and back to our offices. Uh, next week we'll be talking about travel and the following week we'll be talking about luxury. Um, so I'd also like to thank Cultural Communications, uh, who's very kindly introduced us to the panelists, who I, I think you're going to find very interesting. Uh, and all very well informed people um, to give us their insight. So the three panelists. Uh, the first panelist is Despina Katsikakis. Uh, she's at Cushman and Wakefield, where she runs the Occupy Business Performance Team. Uh, she's internationally renowned expert on, on physical workspace. And just recently, right, quite topically, I think she's just got over one million Chinese professionals back into their offices since January. And uh, she's also been instrumental in creating the six week office, six, sorry, the six feet office concept, which is basically building on the, the notion of six feet, two meter social distancing, but bringing that into the office environment. So I'm sure she'll discuss that with us. Uh, second panelist is Karen Gill, MBE. She's the co-founder of Everyone. Uh, I think for 20 years or more than 20 years, Karen's been devoting herself to the advancement of women in business. Uh, she's organized numerous conferences, leadership programs around the world. Um, and Every Woman as a platform, I think it is a, a platform, uh, provides in innovative online resources and development tools. And they're used by corporations, individuals, and government agencies. And the final panelist is David Lepan. Uh, he is currently the chairman of Captis Intelligence, uh, which is a very interesting company. It provides a truly unique security and asset protection system. Uh, harnesses cutting edge technology and, and crowdsourcing. Uh, Dave's also a tech pioneer. I think he's founded several companies and among his entrepreneurial and philanthropic endeavors, he founded WorldCheck, which is a risk intelligence platform. Uh, the luxury lifestyle publication, Bilner, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and one of his many claims to fame actually is that he was the very first backer of the Global Citizen concert, which raised over $1.3 billion in its very, very first year. Um, I will introduce Rishad, even though I won't be handing over to him now. Uh, Rishad Salamat, uh, he's based in Hong Kong, same as, same as me. I get the pleasure of watching him every morning on Bloomberg TV. Uh, I think he's one of their longest serving anchors on TV globally. Um, and he's interviewed so many people over the years, uh, including guys like Michael O'Leary, Tony Blair, uh, Benazir Bhutto, Kevin Rudd, even Bill Clinton. Um, and hopefully we'll be hearing his dulcet tones at some point during this webinar. Um, so let me, oh, just one point of, uh, of, uh, uh, on, on the questions and the chats. There's a, there's a Q&A button there, so if you wanted to direct a question actually to the panel, please put that under the, the Q&A button. And there's also a chat function there if you just wanted to make general comments uh, throughout the webinar. Um, so uh, with no more said, I will pass on to the panelists. Um, and maybe just run through them and let them just share their headline thoughts on, on how they see 2020, 2021 and into the future looking uh, for, for the workplace. Uh, should we start off with Despina? Thank you. Thank you very much. Great to be here and great to join you all. Um, you said in your introduction uh, that we've just finished uh, moving a million people back to the office in China and that came at a very interesting timing. It was just at the time when the UK and the US started shutting down. So we took a lot of the lessons learned from that, which were primarily health and safety considerations, but still a number of different aspects to, to put in place um, an evidence-based evidence roadmap. And, and I say those words very specifically because there's so much noise at the moment around the future and around the experiences we have. So we wanted to make sure we have real data. And this roadmap is really to help our clients navigate the, the current uncertainty on two horizons. Short term, prepare a safe return to the office 
And that's what the six feet off is, is one of the protocols we've created on the back of that. Uh, we've launched um, the 21st of April uh, recovery readiness guide with the um, safe six workplace readiness essentials. And they look at, at a number of issues from preparing the workforce and preparing the building. But also, we are looking at the long term use of lessons learned from the forced remote working to inform a new normal and, and, and reimagine the role of the workplace. Um, so to your question, when we think about the future of the workplace, I think it is absolutely essential that we recognize that we have experienced uh, a life work integration that will completely change our perspectives and expectations of how we will live and work in the future. And we've just finished um, a global survey uh, of 1.5 million uh, data points, which I finalized some of the first findings yesterday. So this is really hot off the press. Um, and there's some really important elements. I'll just give you the quick highlights and what they mean. Um, work has continued for office-based workers almost uninterrupted, which is really important, primarily because effective team collaboration through technology has reached new heights. However, we're still missing human connection and social bonding is suffering, impacting corporate culture and learning. Funny enough, younger generations are struggling more as they often have less access to space and can't separate work life as much. But overall, 72% of our respondents said that they expect their employer to embrace flexible working moving forward. And what we perceive the future to be is that organizations will embrace more remote working. They will see the workplace as no longer a single location that people go to work, but an ecosystem of a variety of locations and experiences that provides choices to support convenience, functionality, uh, and well being. So I'll put that out there as a starting point, and then we can dive back into more details of some of the things I mentioned as, as we go on with the discussion. Marvellous. Thank you. Thank you very much, Despina. Um, Karen, would you want like to sort of lead on? Yes, thank you. Um, that was really interesting, Despina, um, you know, because I think it is all about how we're going to reimagine the workplace and really take on board the lessons that we've learned being forced into the situation that we're cur currently in. And I think, you know, from what you said, I think there's going to be a complete rebalance around the working from home. Uh, policies, if you like, and I think there's probably going to be more of a working from the office policy in future. Um, and absolutely, there is going to be the life work integration. And um, I'm coming at it, obviously, um, with every woman, you know, having worked around the gender balance issue for the past 21 years of how this is going to affect women in the workplace, because that is my life's work. And, and my key uh, concern is about their visibility and that they then take on more of the um, of the caring responsibilities which of course are going to are going to be even more magnified so i'm looking at those things um, and how we can support organizations to make sure that we do not slip back um, to another decade to where we were 10 years ago um, and the last crisis the financial crisis um, forced us to look at things like groupthink lack of diversity causing lack of innovation um, and wrong decision making. So, uh, so my my thinking right now is how do we make sure we keep this on the agenda? How do we keep women visible? How do we keep them supported? That whilst they will continue to work from home, that that life that work life balance does not get out of control again. So that that's my perspective, Colin. That's uh, very interesting. I mean, do, do you think it may even turn into a positive for women in the work workforce? Certainly seems to be a narrative. Uh, I hope so. I'm ever, pos I'm ever positive, but I think that we have to be mindful that there are, you know, I have a workforce now that, you know, immediately became remote and very successfully because of technology. 
but I am, you know, on Zoom every day with the team and the women that have got their children at home that they're trying to homeschool uh, and they're getting constantly interrupted by the little ones. This is not something that is easy to do. And, um, you know, it will fall more, more often to the woman to manage that and balance that than it will the man. And so that's, I think we have to just be mindful of that, that we do get, we do continue to look at that balance and make sure that we don't slip back. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's fingers crossed that we can actually get it, get it right this time. <coughs> and David, what are, your, what are your headline thoughts? Well, you know, my, my headline thoughts are as follows. Um, we need greater balance in our lives. Unfortunately, when we think about what a successful life is, and very often when trying to determine if one is happy or not, it is very much connected to whether you are successful or not. This is inevitably tied, both of those questions are tied to our success at work. And work for me, however, is only a component, not even the principal component of my life. It happens to be one of the components. And what I'm hoping as we come out of this is not only that more people will be able to work from home and have greater balance in their lives, but I'm hoping that people will also be able to determine where home is, right? Taking them out and perhaps even far from the city into the countryside, to the coast, and even to other countries. So for me, this is a very important consideration because if we are happy in our home lives, right, and we are successful in our business lives, and we can do this from a place where we feel fulfilled, then I think we're moving in the right direction. I think simply saying to people that you no longer need to come into the office, you know, in a city, but you need to be within 25 minutes, of being able to be called into the office is not a solution. People will then continue to have to live in postage stamp size apartments. And of course, that is going to be more challenging, particularly if children are being schooled from home more frequently going forward, and you're trying to create both work and home space at home. So my hope is that there's, there's a bigger revolution at play here. It's not just about where I work, it's a question of where I can therefore also live that may be quite fundamentally different in bringing about change to the quality of my life. Yeah, S super interesting. Um, can we jump in, Colin? <laughs> Please, by all means, yeah. I think what David just said is so important. Um, I think this issue about quality of experience and quality of life, I mean, we spend a lot of time measuring what people's experience is. And um, what's interesting, and I made the point right at the beginning that we don't see, the, the theme of going back to work is not the point here. The theme is whether we need to go back to the office and what is the role of the office. And that immediately plays in with where does it relate to where you live. So we've seen um, a lot of governments say come back to work, but we know infrastructure and transport have massive challenges at enabling us to do that in the short term safely. We are seeing immense opportunities of creating regional, local places for people to create that social bond that they're missing, which might be completely remote from city centers. Uh, there's an opportunity to reinvent the high streets in small towns uh, around mm. the world and create that com that face-to-face -face community more locally. Uh, many of our clients are beginning to look at how they can tap into um, clusters of where their people live and make it much more convenient for them to be able to work closer to their home particularly in, in New York City or London, where uh, you have some significant commute times uh, of people coming into those uh, places. So I think we're going to see a real reinvention of the, the again, as I, I mentioned earlier, this idea of a network and ecosystem that allows us to create life first and 
the ability of your life work allowing you to do your best work rather than the other way around, which is what we've sort of had for a long time. Just to say that uh, I did, and I have to say my mathematics skills are beyond limited. Um, I was an appalling student at school. <laughs> Um, but this is what I can say, is there are approximately 4 billion urban dwellers, so people who live, you know, in an urban setting. And I did a couple of quick calculations a number of weeks ago. On average, we spend about 160 odd hours a year commuting. That's an average, right? There'll be many that spend many more, there'll be many that spend considerably less. But on average, it's about 160 hours of commuting a year, according to some of the sources I found. Well, if we multiply that by 4 billion, you start to get to the point where you understand the sheer magnitude of time wow. that is wasted by the mm -hmm. most highly educated, most well-trained, most experienced, and most costly individuals on, on the planet. It is yeah. an astronomical amount of waste that is just not necessary. It's also a significant David, carbon it was, footprint. It reminds yeah. me of the quote that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. We can't return to normal <laughs> because normal was the problem. And yeah. I personally um, was commuting um, in London and knew that it was making me very, very sick and very stressed. And, um, you know, I've now been at home down in Sussex for the last eight weeks and I Zoom with my sister who's in Sydney on a weekly basis and she tells me I look 10 years younger, uh, which is always a good thing. But, basically, but I do feel so much better. I, I knew that the life that I was living, packed on a train, in the mornings and in the evenings and in during the day on the tube system was very, very unhealthy for both my well-being and my physical health. So for me, I have totally embraced this. But I think the important thing is, is, is what you've said is an exciting um, reinvention of our lives because our lives were out of control for urban dwellers specifically. But I also hope that there is going to be a real economic rebalance. I think one of the things that has been extremely highlighted is how we as a society have got our economic balance completely out of whack and that our key workers, our teachers, voluntary workers are struggling on a pittance. And then we have salaries, um, you know, in, in finance sectors. Now, me personally, I'm also as a, 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 about the greater balance that we need in our lives and our societies. That's it, a really great point, Karen, because um, one of the things that I talk to clients about all the time is measuring the right things. And um, I, I, come, I, I come from the real estate world, so uh, often we look at reducing the cost of real estate, which is a very small part of OPEX, about 15%, um, and creating a very negative impact on people. And David's calculations on the productive time um, was fascinating because basically one of the things that we know is people that have long commutes typically give their productive time back to work when they work from home, on the days they work from home. And they also have about 47% uh, less of a carbon footprint, as well as significantly less absentees, and because they're less, as you said, from your own experience. So when we look at measuring the right things, reducing absenteeism, reducing carbon, increasing uh, productive time and employee engagement, uh, are significant drivers for any business. And, and ironically, the thing that underpins them is trust. And one thing I didn't mention about our survey is that our participants said that for the first time ever, 90% of them felt that finally their managers trusted them to work remotely, which I think is well, going to- I'm not sure that they have much of a choice. 
Oh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I think that's a really important point, though, is that trust. I mean, even with the 365 Aviation, um, it's a debate that's come up many times because we are a business that has to work 24-7. There are times when we're extremely busy and we need to be busy at 3 o'clock in the morning. There's times when we all have to collaborate as a team. And then there's time, you know, where you can relax a little bit. And there's always been this big debate about, you know, do people work, work productively from home? And you trust them. I mean, you should always be able to trust your employees. And I think that's the, probably the best part of this experiment. We've all been forced to actually try, try the experiment. And I don't know, most of the people that I'm hearing, and certainly from us, I think we've been pleasantly surprised that we feel that we're operating at 100%. We don't feel like we really lose very much at all. Well, the data... Yes, and I think to add to that, David, um, sorry, I think okay. to add to that, Colin, is that um, I think that, that combined with being at home, and having a really clear sense of purpose around what they're doing um, themselves in, in terms of interacting with the crisis that we're in and what they're having to do for their families, for their own health, but also what they're having to do to save their businesses and, and their colleagues. They've got colleagues that have been put on furlough or colleagues that have been made redundant. That, that purpose-led, um, you know, the purpose that they've now got has also made them much more energetic i think that's what i feel and i'm seeing with our businesses that they are really anchored onto getting through this together in collaboration with the clients with their team members and i think that has also helped with the trust issue yes uh, hugely actually interestingly enough i did a round table of um 15 ceos of uh, tech companies last week and the overriding feedback, the top three things they said had significantly changed was that this crisis has made us all from government to corporations to individuals take a human first approach. That companies had reinforced their values and refocused on purpose and empowering leadership and trust looking at well-being and social responsibility was really coming into action. So that's absolutely aligns with what you just said, Karen. May I interrupt? It's Rashad Salama. I needed PC support, actually, which would have been a problem if I was working from home, which I sort of am, I suppose, ultimately. <laughs> here. Uh, uh, but working from home is an incredibly hard thing it's very, very difficult to balance what's going around. I've had it from personal experience with the family around you, and then work itself. And how, and I'm gonna put this actually to David, how do you detach yourself? How do you actually focus on one thing and not feel in sort of purgatory almost? <clears throat> um, great question. Here's the thing, I've worked from home for 20 years. You so don't count this. So I don't <laughs> most of my working life at the age of 47, most of my working life has been um, from home. And in fact, it's probably more than 20 years I've worked from home. Um, but I'm one of the early ones to have seen that there was little necessity for me to be sitting in an office or for me to be commuting to an office, to be there before the bus got in and to stay until after he had left, right? Those kind of absurdities I was able to get rid of at a very early age. And I was able to convince my bosses at the time that the amount of time I was investing to fly to my clients, who were principally the financial community in Switzerland and elsewhere in Europe, I was spending a huge amount of time getting to my markets, away from home, away from my children, and finally then flying home again, to then be expected to be in the office before he got there on Monday morning. I sort of said, listen, I, I can't give you more commitment than what I'm already giving you. Let me work from home. Now, the, the question really is, Rishab, around the way we are living is not set up for us to be able to work from home because that's not been the model for the majority of people. The majority of people have been required to work from an office like good little minions where the boss can stare out of his fish tanks and see his rows of soldiers, right, at their desks. The reality is that we are now in an, a, a situation at home that we had never set ourselves up for. 
So that means our homes have to change. The way we live at home has to change. And of course, at the moment, we've got this double or triple whammy that our children are home as well. They're not at school. Well, here's the thing. I think we are heading in the direction of much more schooling from home. I don't say homeschooling. I say schooling from home. And I think this is a trend going forward. In Australia, they've done this since the 1950s via radio to rural community children. So in our instance, to answer your question, I think we need to be saying to ourselves, if we are not needed in a skyscraper, in the center of very sensitive I can work from home, where would home be? That a place that I'm ideally in a far better place for my children, for my family, for myself, where I have more space than the tiny one bed apartment that I have in some expensive city. Once you've got space, you can set yourself up in order to be able to work from home. Okay, David, I, I wanted to ask to Spin and Karen, um, either one of you, whoever wants to go first, uh, who's the least experienced at working from home and what's been your journey? They have. Karen, just... Well, I, I, yes, it's Karen here. I, I have, you know, been working from home for the last four weeks and the last time I worked from home on a consistent basis was when I had my child 22 years ago. Um, and of course, it, life was very different back then because there just wasn't the technology to, to be able to stay so connected. It, I, we, what we say, every woman, as what has happened to us over the last eight weeks has fast tracked our business and, and transformed us digitally, which what what we should have been doing. Um, but I agree with I David. Agree with David that, you, that, that, that you, there that are considerations. There are consider um, feedback. Sorry, I don't know whether you are, but. Um, I'm very lucky, you know, I'm in a house in Sussex and I have an off a home office. So it's quite easy for me to shut the door, go and have lunch, shut the door, go and have a walk at the end of the day and shut the door in the evening. But I'm on Zoom to my team, many of whom are in, just as David has described, very small city apartments. And I could see that they were working from their sofa on their laptop. And, and one of our um, women said, you know, she's gone out on eBay and bought a home office kit and it's made such a difference that she's converted a corner of her flat to the office that she shuts down in the evening and walks away from. But I, I think David is saying it's so exciting that what if we embrace this and the opportunity it gives us to re-look really at our entire lives and decide where our home can be and it can be anywhere we want it to be because we can still continue to work is a really, I know, is a, going to be a really exciting period for many people. We do compromise our lives living in a city. You know, lots of people I know live in the city are keen sailors or keen horse riders, but they just don't get to do that stuff. So I, I actually think it's very exciting about how Karen. we will look at. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I mean, from your perspective as well here, um, I think there was a 2015 study conducted in the US talking about six childbirth women who work from home actually have a statistically huge difference in their levels of depression and it, it could empower women couldn't it definitely it's definitely a positive for women we've been you know um lobbying for this in organizations to get flexible and working from home in bigger numbers than it is as a policy uh, because we know that women benefit from it and so does society, so do the children being able to be picked up in the afternoon by your parent and then come back and, and, and spend a couple of hours with your kids and then do some work in the evening to be able to be flexible, which is why there has been a growth in female entrepreneurs over the last decade, because they can work like that. They don't have anybody telling them they can't. And so, you know, we've done a lot of work around that. So, yes, it's going to have a huge impact for women. And many other people, people with disabilities who find it very difficult to get in and out of work in our cities. There's lots to be gained here. Uh, I, I think if I, I, can sorry, I, I want to just show. go on, go on, David. Just to say that, you know, this is, uh, I had this conversation with a number of friends of mine who um, suffer from a variety of very debilitating, you know, diseases and conditions. And they equally, welcomed this change because they see it as a huge opportunity for themselves where they are unable because of their health and how precarious you know it is to com commit to commuting into a city every day and just sitting in an office every day yet they 
people want to be able to contribute. They want to be able to earn money. They want to be able to, you know, be part of something bigger. And so this is not just, I think, for women or for men. And, you know, I think we need to look at this. At the I agree. That at the moment are struggling to be able to contribute because their health doesn't allow them to in the way that we have perceived work. I agree, David. But I would emphasise that, um, you know, still in the 21st century, women do um, do the lion's share of care, home care. And so that's why it is, you know, really poignant for women to have that flexibility, because in silver case, care is a big, big issue now for families. But on there's a double edged sword, um, which is why I really like your um, point about local communities and local networks because one of the double-edged swords for women being in the home all the time is we're not all in great happy homes and we have seen the increase in stick violence during this crisis which is just dreadful and the point is those women have nowhere and, and men in some instances but they have nowhere to go and those networks will be critical if you are in a more remote place and you are housebound um, well, not housebound, but in the home all the time. So, I, you know, again, I think that's a really important point about creating those places. Despina, what's your take on this? Is you know, there's there's a lot of talk about this naturally, and people talk about new normal. The word unprecedented has been used unprecedentedly often. And <laughs> the thing is, uh, you know, in your line of work, what what are you seeing? Well, we've seen a number of shifts over the last 20 years. And, and to your question, I haven't had a desk in 25 years, but I haven't necessarily worked from home most, most of the time. I used to say I was based on British Airways, but I think we can avoid that for a minute <laughs> until uh, we have a new normal, whatever that is. But um, we've seen space utilization of office buildings be as low as 50 percent on a typical day because people already work flexibly. We've seen CEOs recognize the lost value of commute time, as David pointed out. Uh, we've seen engagement become critical in being able to be tied to flexibility of how, when, and where you work. The fundamental difference that this situation has created is this has embedded the fact that we can now see that organizations that had in place remote technology to enable effective collaboration actually have had almost no productivity drop. So in, in I, I, I'm not sure if you were on when I was talking about our recent research, which we just finished of 1.5 million uh, data points, which looked at absolutely a consistent workplace experience and in fact team collaboration going through the roof during this period. However, we are still social animals. We, are, we want human connection and we're missing that more than ever. Not just because we're locked in our homes, we've always missed that. We miss that ability to brainstorm to be creative. So what I see is that the office will have a very different purpose in the future. It will not be about commuting for an hour to go sit at rows of desks uh, just because your boss should see you as David rightly um, uh, outlined. It will be about going to an inspiring location once, twice a week to be connected meaningfully with colleagues, to be part of a culture and the values of the organization, to learn, to collaborate effectively. And you might be one or two days a week working somewhere near where you live, and you might be working from home one or two days a week. And I think that um, choice and freedom and flexibility to, to support a network that supports that really underpins um, our management of space, time, and location uh, to create a better work-life balance, better experience, and better well-being uh, is 
kind of the silver lining on the back of this crisis? Go from here. In the short term, it's an interesting journey. Uh, because a lot of, the, you know, the, the talk has been all about going back to work. I, I personally disagree with that. I think, you know, who needs to go back to work in the short term is a really important um, piece. Who needs to go well, to We work? haven't been off work, have we? That's the exactly. point. Exactly. So not who going needs back to go to, to the office? office? Who needs to yeah, go who's in? going back to the office? And, and there are very small groups of people that actually need to go into the office. Obviously, people that have... Isn't, isn't the danger here, effectively, I think the French call it, a literal translation is info-obesity, because you end up being always on. And when you're yes. at home, you can't always be on. And this is something which effectively has been outlawed by, by a, uh, some parts of French law. Not all of it, but certain instances of it. Uh, do you think some legislation is required, let's say, in the UK or elsewhere? Yes, that's, that's a great point. So um, one of the things I didn't mention is the lowest performing aspect of workplace experience before COVID was our ability to renew and manage our well-being. It has remained the lowest performing aspect, even though we're now at home. And that's because we're all on these devices all day long. So the ability to create policies, communication, to manage mental and physical well-being will be critical because I do think the backlash of this is going to be a huge buildup of stress, a lot more mental uh, issues, a lot greater uh, reduction in, in physical well-being because if, if I just look at myself, I've gone from moving around the world every week to being literally tied to my desk chair for 12 hours a day. So, and that's not, you know, most of my team have the same experience. So yes, hugely important. I, I concur with that. That's been, a, and a lot of our clients have been creating a lot of information out to their colleagues about well-being. And, how, and, and the things that they need to do. It's been a real uplift in the usage of our content is all around the well-being piece. Um, but, I, but again, I think there's the other side to it in terms of how do you, you help people with this transition into being at home and working from home. I mean, you know, I'm doing online yoga for the first time. In, I'm doing yoga for the first time in years because I can do it online. I don't have to travel to be there. It's not so time consuming. So I think that organisations are really um, about this. They're thinking about how are they going to give their people, if, if you like, the permission to get away from their desk, to not be on all the time. We know that we get um, the biggest uptake of um, attendance to things like our webinar, webinars will come when the organisation has endorsed the, um, or given you know the permission, if you like, for people to attend. If it's just up to the person, they might feel, oh, well, I can't really take the time out to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think there's going to be a lot of um, information and policy, if you like, around managing your well-being when you are at home. I, you know, if I can jump in here, um, Richard, if you if you allow me, you I know, do. I laugh at my friends who, having having spent pretty much sort of better part of 20 years living on an island, um, two hours from London, right? Um, when I go to London, sometimes it's quicker than some of my friends who are commuting from, you know, Brighton. Um, when I have them visit me and they come out and they sit next to the pool and we have breakfast and they look out over the, the sea and they at some point say, you know... I'm not sure I can listen to any more, David. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, with, I'm with Karen on this one, actually. <laughs> When, when they say, you know, I'm going to have to put in just a few more years, you know, to, to keep doing this, you know, I've, I've looked forward to these few days that I've taken off all year. And I very often sit there and sort of say to them, you know, I, I think you could change your entire setup, right? I think you're at a point already in your career where you could make the decision to live a different life. You're choosing not to but you have the opportunity to do this. What I found is if people have the option 
to work from home and they have the choice of determining where home is, if it takes them into a place where they feel better, and that might be the weather, it could be a more rural setting, it could be to have access to horse riding or biking or trekking or fishing or whatever it is, right? If you put people, if you allow them to be in an environment that they want to be in, wellness will be addressed. I don't know that we need yes. to teach people too much. We may need to encourage them, but I don't think we need to teach people too much if we allow them the freedom to be where they feel great, where they are closer to the things that they're passionate about, right? You cannot, I believe, you have to be focused on finding what fulfills your life. And the answer should not be work. That should be I one. I think encourage is the great word, David. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but there's one I thing think I there's also a I mean, generational very, very well. thing. Yes. Can, I, can I just finish? Because ultimately we have a situation where David lives on an island. Fantastic. Good on you, mate. Uh, the, the, the thing I want to get to is, okay, <laughs> it's all very well to speak from an ivory tower perspective, but are we then also creating, in effect, a new working class, people who simply cannot work from home? Mm. Yeah. Any one of you. I, yeah. I think I think it's a great point, Richard. And and uh, one of the a couple of things on this. First of all, what we've seen in our data is that the younger generation have struggled enormously because they don't have the space to separate work from life because they have childcare. And baby boomers who have resisted it the most previously have thrived because they've had more space. Some of them might have even lived on an island. But there's a bigger issue here, which is the social responsibility of thinking about our cities differently and creating that connection with nature that David talks about giving him such great joy uh, for all people to have access to. Mm -hmm. I think that is a much bigger um, social issue how do we give people the opportunity to be connected to healthier cities, to places that inspire them in the public realm, as well as to have better housing? We know that housing in, in England is one small, well, not as small as Hong Kong, but, but nearly there. Um, so I think there are much bigger social issues. So your point is spot on. I don't think we can create um, a culture of, of uh, a privilege of just being able to choose that you can go away and work in your ivory tower. I think we need to plan for both. Anyone else? Yes, I agree, because I think we have to think of the younger generation. They, um, and they don't want to live our lives. You know, we, we, when we first started, everyone, when we started to you know, talk about role models and show women that have worked for 30 years and reached the top. Actually, when we spoke to the younger women and they looked at that and said, well, that's not the life I want. And um, so I think we, they, they want to live different lives. And I think the sense of purpose, working for something that has a, a good value system is really important. And then being connected to social enterprise, um, and, and the world in a bigger place is very, very important to them. So, yes, we've got to reinvent everything, really. Ironically, many we corporations... We have to build a world are, where everyone can... Be. Oops, sorry, Karen. I was going to say, ironically, many corporations are using, have start, had started using co-living environments to bring together communities of young people and bring the ability to have more shared spaces uh, in city centers. And, and there's some really interesting ideas of how we can use shared resources to achieve some yeah. of these um, um, elements that, uh, and benefits that we're talking about. Yeah, I, you know, I want to come... Well, there is now the sophisticated development... Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, I, I want to um, Richard, and point out, you know, I, have, uh, I have three children, the eldest is 20. So I, I get something of an insight into their world and that generation's world through her and her friends. I'm acutely aware that here on Ibiza, we have a broad 
bouquet of people from the wealthy to truly people who are not very wealthy at all and we are going to have huge challenges in light of the fact that the seas and the island will not be open because the majority of people who work on the island work in tourism and they only work for the six months that the island really operates as a tourist destination so we we are already facing increases in the demand for soup kitchens and increases in the demand to the red cross for uh, food parcels on the island. And we haven't even started the summer. So we, we've got real issues on the island as well. What I'm seeing when I look at the young folk today um, is that they have very different priorities to the priorities I and my colleagues had um, 25 years ago. And I, I, again, think that they probably have figured out that the road many of us have taken is not a path that they want to go down. We're seeing on the island lots of co-working spaces scattered all over, both in town, in Ibiza town, but equally out in the countryside to give people of all ages the opportunity to leave their homes and come and hang out. But in many instances, it's young people leaving relatively small spaces, either just a bedroom within their parents' home or a flat share, leaving that in order to find a space that's more conducive to their working. So I, I, I think when we talk about young people, I think we need to recognize that they already have a very different vision and they are motivated in a very different way to the way we were just one generation ago. But of course, one of the biggest challenges to yeah, doing absolutely. all this is going to be you have a recession, you've got millions of people unemployed. Look at what happened in the UK, what it's likely to happen in the UK, what's 20 million people have become unemployed in the United States. Now, that gives employers a huge, huge advantage that they don't have to change. How do you surmount, surmount, surmount that problem itself? I still think employers I, will want I don't to see why best employers out. wouldn't want to change. Uh, whoever yes. first, Despina. Uh, employers will still want to maintain their top talent, uh, regardless of a recession. Uh, we saw that in 2008, uh, still engagement of, key, of the key people, that was what will give them competitive advantage. So the fact that you know, over 70% of those people expect their employer to embrace a flexible working policy after this, I think will drive it um, very significantly. Um, so, David, I mean, uh, we have one um, point being made just a little while ago, which is, um, is the office going to become a place of collaboration, one where you can build a team? Because it's very difficult to build a team when you are working from home. It, it, it's, human interaction is hugely important in, uh, for, your, for your career. So, great question. I mean, two comments that I'd make on that. All of the businesses I've built have been global. And when we say that, don't think tens of thousands of people. I'm talking about relatively small businesses, um, somewhere between you know, a dozen individuals and 500, right? And they were scattered across the globe. We had no issue whatsoever in operating as a team. We had no issue whatsoever in ensuring that the ethos of what we were doing was translated right across the globe to all of those individuals, some working from home in their own homes as salespeople, other working in some research facilities around the world. So I, you know, I don't really buy into the belief that if we don't get to look one another in the eye, in the flesh, we're unable to build and, you know, and establish the company's ethos and team spirit. I just, I don't buy into it. It's the same argument people make that my children need to go to school in order to learn social skills. Mm -hmm. And I say to them, well, that's a pretty appalling, appalling position. <laughs> you think that your kids are going to learn social skills sitting in a class mm -hmm. of 20 to 30 other kids with an underpaid team. Yes. I, 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 mean, that's, I have that's, to say, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree with you, uh, David. Not on the social skills in children, by the way, but on the, on the building corporate culture. I do think you need to bring people together. I don't think you need to bring people together every day, by no means. But I think you need to bring people together meaningfully. 
And in, in all the years I've done this, the organizations that actually create innovation tend to focus on that element precisely, how you bring people together to innovate, to brainstorm, to exchange ideas in ways that we can't do remotely. Um, and I think that's not a day-to-day -day activity, it's an ad hoc activity, but building social bonds and uh, nurturing innovation is very much, from my perspective, what the office, the role of the office will be. I just want to change tack a little bit here and talk about bosses. They might also step up their monitoring of uh, employee interactions, for instance. The, I think PwC came up with uh, uh, plans to launch a contact tracing tool for employers. <laughs> now, that worries <laughs> a lot of people, cool. doesn't it? I mean, that's the thing. They want to know what their employees are doing. So, I mean, it's a legitimate uh, concern, I suppose, but because that goes back to the trust issue, doesn't it? Yeah. It yeah. certainly Apparently. does. But I, 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 I think that that is a really outmoded uh, way of leading a, a team and an organisation. And, you know, we've just been talking about how it, people will respond to being purpose-led, what they are contributing, what they get back from their work. Um, and I think that tracking people's time is a, a very outmoded way of operating. And I think it's ridiculous, personally. Uh, and having seen how our team have, I mean, gone beyond what they used to do in the office over the past two months, because they really want to be part of creating a different way of working and, and continuing their work to make the, you know, the workplace a better place for women. So I, I think they want a loser on that one. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Karen on this. There is, however, the slippery slope of how they get to that, because at the moment we're being asked to uh, consider a lot of tracking uh, related to our health and safety. And that's, that's kind of where, uh, to what extent do we sign up willingly to being tracked uh, versus being required to, I think is going to be a very, uh, interesting argument over the next few months. Um, we haven't got much time left. Uh, all panelists, this is a question from uh, Giorgio Martelli. Um, what have you learned personally from the COVID-19 crisis and what have been your biggest challenges? This one to Despina. My biggest challenge has been losing my freedom to choose where and how to work, uh, by far. Uh, and the greatest learning has been how important the um, leadership engagement uh, had needed to be to actually create this dramatic shift because I've certainly been advocating to companies for over 25 years that they don't need to go to work to be working. Um, but this trust issue that we've talked about, I think, has now shifted and we'll see a new future on the out of the back of it. But it's also a rather dystopian question. How, from uh, Raghudev Menon, how about if the virus is the new norm and we need to live with it and we need to go to work anyways? What do you mean? Is, that, is that for me to answer? <laughs> that is for you to answer. Okay. So here, I mean, here's the thing, right? We are born with very little of an immune system. Um, we have to develop an immune system. We interact with bacteria all of our lives. We have bacteria, good and bad, in, within our own gut, within our own digestive system. We, whether you want to wear masks, gloves, goggles, a spacesuit, or anything else, you will come into contact with bacteria and viruses throughout your entire life. And so I, I've been pushing the question, what is killing us here, the virus or our lifestyles? You know, are, are we actually looking at what the underlying medical conditions are of those that are passing from this? Are we considering the individuals that commit suicide every 40 seconds in our world, 800,000 people a year who choose to end their lives? You know, what, what is actually killing us here? And so, yes, the virus probably will be around for a long time. I mean, tuberculosis, we don't have a vaccine for adults. 
We have a vaccine for children. We still manage to go around operating perfectly well, right? So I, I am a firm believer in the fact that we are going to have to get accustomed to the idea that this will be here for quite some time and quite possibly no vaccine will ever be found to be effective on this. Therefore, we need to focus on our lifestyle and we need to focus on our immunity. Uh, very, very quickly here, what about how management, I mean, I, I touched on that about contact, etc., and contact tracing and seeing what your employees are up to, but what about the, the whole makeup of management? If this does come to some sort of fruition, how does that change? This is my final question. It's a bit lighthearted. Is it the revenge of the nerds because they can't actually deal with talking to people face to face? <laughs> that would be great, wouldn't it? The revenge of the nerds. For me, I think, you know, the learning for me has been how freeing trust is. And I think that that's what the new leaders of tomorrow will have to have. They'll have to be purpose-led, empathetic, diverse, but they will have to trust the people that work for them. And that's how they will get the best talent. Yes, yeah. I, I completely yeah. agree. David? No, I, I totally agree with that. You know, but it actually has, it has serious implications in the sense that how, does, how do people actually then evolve in management and how do you have a new career path if you can't actually meet your boss and talk to that person and have a free-flowing exchange of ideas? But I think, you're, you, again, we, 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 we tend to go into the either-or, and I don't think it's an either-or. I don't think we will just all be stuck in our homes or... Uh, and, and just work remotely. I, you know, it, when you do both, then you do meet your boss. You actually build a face-to-face -face relationship and you have a virtual working relationship with your boss. So I don't think those things go away at all. And in fact, most senior managers today grow through organizations by managing remote teams. Mm. It actually goes to a question from uh, an anonymous attendee who was ask, actually asking to speak you the uh, question on how should employers of any size manage and monitor personal and professional development, especially with junior team members working from home. I think you essentially answered that in, in large yeah. part. Yeah, and, and, I, and I would Absolutely. say being outcome I would like to add to that, Despina. Yes, please. Uh, I, one of the things we need to be mindful of there um, is that though we don't create a great another gender gap because it will be easier for men to meet their boss in the pub and have a chat um, you know in, in town or, or wherever um, and it won't be as easy not just um, from an operational point of view with the home etc but it won't feel as comfortable for a woman to do that or and for the boss if he's a man to ask her so I think we have to be very mindful of those new social norms and how we how we do connect uh, with the team and with bosses, etc. I think if I can jump in, Richard, I, I think there is a, a, a fundamental underlying question here around even the concept of career and if that is not now already outdated. I think we recognize people are going to have multiple different jobs or multiple different careers, if you prefer to use that term. I think we will work for multiple companies. We will dip in and out of work in the yeah. same way companies will dip in and out of their requirements or their demands for our expertise. I think we've got to look at a far bigger change than perhaps just adapting to working from home versus from sometimes. It's yeah, that's a great point that David's making. And I think we need to really take that seriously. In this, uh, I, I, I heard from a client uh, just before our webinar that um, most of their um, newer employees have said they now want to be freelance and be able to work across multiple companies. Yeah. Yes, but again, we must be mindful of demographic groups. There will be people that just don't have choices, that are working in low paid yes. jobs, that will not have you know, this, this perspective to their working life at all. Uh, yes, yes. I, th I think the other thing we should be mindful of is that you know, by some estimates, 800 million jobs will be lost in the middle, upper and high income countries to artificial intelligence over the next 15 years. Yeah. So when we just need to think about the fact that the concept of work and working from home and where we live 
um, is going to be massively impacted by huge, huge, huge layoffs um, of people um, as we regain our humanity almost, as we move from being man power to being mankind again, and as machines take on a lot of the mundane, repetitive kind of roles and jobs that up until now we've been required to do. And so I think the whole conversation around being able to work much more freelance in a freer way, in a freer environment, is going to be very much accompanied by the fact that a lot of people are going to see dramatic changes to, to you know, opportunities within the workplace. Mm. I, I think we need to wrap up now. I, I just want to just leave you with a thought, which is that uh, I think that what we're getting is before COVID-19, uh, people, we had companies who were sort of being gently moved or being just nudged towards uh, uh, allowing people to work from home. And now I think they're getting a great big shove. That definitely is the case. Uh, Zip Recruiter, for one thing, in the US saying that before mid-March, only 1.3% of jobs advertised actually explicitly offered the opportunity to work from home. Now, as of, I think, last week, it was um, nearly 12% do. So I think that we might be moving in that direction. Thank you so much, Thanks. David, Karen, <clears throat> and Justina. Great talk talking to you. Sorry about my... Um, uh, well, my Ludditism, as it were, but uh, anyway. Uh, thank you, guys, and thank you, Colin and Charlotte as well. And I look forward to hearing from you when I will log on and try to log on at least half an hour beforehand and see if I can be on time. And it's going to be the next one, which is the future of travel, and I'll leave the last few words to Colin. Trisha, thank you very much. Like any great resource, you started a bit late, but you still came across the line first. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, and obviously, Despina, Karen, David, very, very interesting chat. And just looking at the, the various questions and comments we've had on the chat, um, I think people were quite absorbed by it. Um, and yes, we should thank uh, Colin, Sean. Just one second. Who was there was a, one, one second, Colin. There's a great question at the end of, uh, uh, of this. Is uh, An anonymous attendee says, what do we say to a boss who's unwilling to adapt to remote working? Well, I'm sure you can think of a two, suitable two <laughs> I was thinking of I resign, but there could be two other words you could use. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just, how about that? Just to wrap up, it has been a fascinating chat. I was just thanking Charlotte Heath Bullock from uh, Cultural Communication. She's been the Wizard of Oz this evening. She's been behind the curtain, making sure that everything works. Um, and yeah, and as Richard said, um, same time, same place next week, we will be discussing the future of travel, which should be interesting. Uh, at the moment, we will have someone from Rosewood Hotels and also the uh, adventure travel company, Polaris. So um, we'll be sending out some invites to that, but hopefully uh, many of you can join us again next week. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, have a great rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.